I would prefer that Israel extend sovereignty over all the area, either immediately or in stages. And next it. And next it. Hmm. Although I wouldn't use the word annex because it's my land, so I don't annex my country. First, there's a religious meaning. Secondly, there's a Zionist pioneering ethos. Mm -hmm. We still think that the process of resettling the land of Israel is going on, and therefore someone has to come out here. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you come out here. The Jewish residents of Judea and Samaria will continue to be here. That's number one. Right. Even if they get a state, because we've been told you can't have apartheid regime. And if the Palestinian Authority becomes a state and kicks me out, that's apartheid. Okay? So it works both ways. You're a Trump supporter? I, let's put it this way. I'm very happy that President Trump is president. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, again, if I said this four years ago, but a lot of people said, how can you be here? It's against America. Well, now it's not against America to be here or to have Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And so things change mm -hmm. for the good, at least for our good. So sometimes if you sit still, hold on to things, it'll come your way. All right, young and naive, we're Back in Palestine, but you don't call Palestine, right? Not at all. This is Judea and Samaria. Palestine ended in 1948. So we've been uh, we've been here before, four years ago. Make make sure to check that out. What has changed? Uh, probably everything that I told you four years ago <laughs> happened, especially the good parts. We've 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 grown. Now in Shiloh, we have over 400 uh, families here. We, compared to four years ago? I, four years ago, there must have been about maybe th maybe 300, 320 maybe. We have a new girls' high school being built. For uh, girls only? Excuse me? For girls only? For girls only. The boys is in Ailey over on the other side there. Uh, for religious uh, communities, <clears throat> about 85% of them will send their high school kids, which means about the age of 13 or so, 13, 14, to a high school of separate education. In our religious communities, about 40%, if not more, but I don't want to be too exact, mm -hmm. will send them to dormitories. In other words, the, the boys, even at the age of 13, 14, will only come home every, once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. The girls, much less. I have already a granddaughter <clears throat> in a second year at uh, a girls' high school in Ofra, down the road from us. Segregated uh, as well? Segregated, yes. Separate sex. Is that a good thing? Uh, we think it's good for two reasons. I think that they study better and learn better without the interference of uh, boys who throw spitballs and make fun and They, or they want to play football or soccer. And uh, studies have shown that uh, educationally it's much better. Secondly, we are more of a conservative society in the relationships between the two genders. And so uh, we prefer that they, at this pubescent age of, of, of realizing who they are as a man or male and female, right that they do it in separate educational institutions. Do they get Israeli education, like uh, like uh, what the state wants young, young people to learn? Most definitely. In the schools that we uh, deal with, I'm not talking about the ultra-Orthodox, that's a different story. Mm. Most of our communities, if they're religious, they're what they call modern religious, mm -hmm. and therefore they learn physics, history, language. Um, my, my granddaughter is already in her second language. She plays violin, piano, and uh, guitar, uh, and they put on performances. They're very, from a European point of view at least, very modern, very involved, very social. They're not uh, in a ghetto, in a, in educationally. But what, what, uh, like you mentioned the European perspective, what don't they get? Like what, what, what is different? Uh, they, to, to like an American high school. They will not have parties together, boys and girls. That's, uh, that's important for young people to have. It's important for what you think they should have. We don't think so. It's not that they don't go to weddings or to bar mitzvahs or to other 
affairs with or see boys and girls. Uh, some people once said that our camp has so many demonstrations because that's the best way to boy to meet girl. Mm. <laughs> but uh, they don't dance together uh, or have fun in a sense of partying. We, we view that with a very critical eye. When are they, when are they allowed to party? Uh, when they get married. Like the, the wedding is their first party? Well, in a general sense, in terms of partying, where there's right. wild music and dancing, and yes. Can they choose their um, partner? Oh, yes. We, we, well, I would say maybe 20% or more are what we call, I'm not going to say arranged marriages. Mm -hmm. That's in the ultra-Orthodox community. Really? But uh, introductions. You know, either a mother or an aunt or a rabbi will say, I think I know someone who's in line with your thinking and with your personality, uh, and you should go out and see how it is. How do these, these weddings work out? Like other divorces? I'm sure there are divorces. We're not a, a community that is uh, separate from the main influences of society today. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the main... I mean, there is dating, there is going out. It could take a year or two. Uh, we're not talking, to, again, maybe people have the impression because the Orthodox, basically it's very arranged. The boy will be told, this is your wife. The girl will be told, this is your husband. They'll meet maybe they, once they, or twice they have or three to, times. They have to get, wet, uh, they have to get married. Be, yeah. Wow. yeah. What if a boy is gay? What the what? What if a boy is gay and he tells his parents like, oh. I can't marry a girl. Well, either they'll get divorced if they do get married, or he'll have to tell his parents that he's not affectionate with girls. What happens then? It could be very problematic because in orthodox circles, again, not our community, in orthodox circles, the brother or sister will say, how can I now get married if I have this person hanging on my on my uh, credit, on my uh, reputation. It re reflects bad on the family? Yeah, it does. In, in them, it's very much insular. And uh, we're not happy with that. And over the past decade or so, especially in the modern Orthodox community, there's a much more open relationship uh, to the situation. Uh, one of my neighbors happens to deal specifically with homosexual, lesbian, modern Orthodox people and trying to work with them and see what can happen. What do you mean? Like work with them, like convert well, to them? See, well, see if it's... Look, in this day and age, sometimes you think it's gay to be gay. Uh, and maybe you're just doing it because you're not sure exactly. And maybe if you, if you talk to, maybe you can come back. If not... Well, it's not a choice. Some people think it is. Mm -hmm. Some people can be influenced psychologically have a feeling and maybe they're on an edge and they don't have to go this way they can still go this way is there a gay community in chile we have i, I think probably about a half a dozen people that i think <laughs> or know are gay yes can they be openly gay in our community openly doesn't mean flaunting yourself or showing off uh that's not i'm not gonna say it's not permitted It would be frowned upon, okay? Mm -hmm. But I know of at least one case in which a couple got married and within a half a year she, she got divorced and she said, you know, I wasn't really told that he was gay. So I was thinking about like two men holding hands and uh, walking the streets of Chile. No, that you wouldn't see. But I know like, for example, I happen to know there's some, I know some people working in the grocery store mm -hmm. who, will, who, will tell, who told me, he said, I'm gay. I thought he wanted, I think he wanted to shock me, but I wasn't shocked. Maybe that he was disappointed that he didn't shock me. Did you say like, Mazel tov. No, I didn't say, I said, oh, that's, that's okay, fine, okay. Have a nice life. Do, do you look at him differently or do you? No, I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm in that area, to be fair to the viewers, I'm not going to say I'm that representative of the society. The rest of society will simply ignore it. You know, 
It's okay. Thirty percent more uh, families in Shiloh. Are, are there more houses, more apartments? The more houses at the entrance coming in. Right. There, are, uh, there are sixty more houses being built. As soon as they're finished and sold, another eighty are going to be built. Uh, you saw we have a traffic circle coming yeah, in. Right. See, we're getting modern. We're not. Ha we don't have a traffic light yet, but we have a traffic circle. Uh, and we've built some more apartments instead of houses. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's about it here. But, for example, Ailey, which is just north of us, they're adding over 150 apartments, and they're moving on. So they're well over 900 families now. Right. So many of our viewers, like last time we talked, like they were wondering, like, what makes life so great f for, uh, for you guys to move here? Because, I mean, you're surrounded by... Uh, Palestinian land, Palestinians. There is always trouble on both sides. So, what can you explain? What what makes life great in Shiloh for you? First, I and, think, like besides the religious meaning of it. Okay, first is the religious meaning. Secondly, there's a Zionist pioneering ethos. Mm -hmm. We still think that the process of resettling the land of Israel is going on, and therefore someone has to come out here. Mm -hmm. And if you want to, you come out here. Third, I think that there's a communal spirit. If people get sick, people cook. If people have uh, a tragedy or a happy event, people come in and help this way or that way. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of working together. I don't know if last time I explained, but we're not exactly kibbutz here for sure. But in terms of the kibbutz reality of everybody's in it together and there are committees for sports and education and youth and, and, and bereavement and happiness and like that, that, that's a type of a community. It's very nice out here. Uh, there are a lot of things uh, that you can do and to realize yourself. Some people come out here, they were professors and now they're growing flowers or, or, or something like that. Uh, and despite the fact that we do suffer at times, it's a lot more peaceful than it was four years ago. Really? Yes. Like, I, like I, I read some UN reports that were also talking about Chilo and there has, have, has been violence on both sides. Um, I said less. I didn't say there was none, number one. Number two, um, we're still stuck with what we call the hilltop youth type of, of uh, phenomenon of youngsters who think that they know best what to do if there's any problems uh, with Arabs and they'll, in some cases, take the law into their own hands. We've been very strong against that. On the other hand, also, to be honest, I don't believe every single report that I read in the Palestinian Authority or the UN report. A lot of it is, uh, I'm not going to say made up, but uh, I had personal experience where I read a news report of like 1,800 trees were chopped down. And I said to him, 1,800 trees? I called up the police myself and they said, yes, the Arabs said there were 900 trees cut down. I said, oh, at least 50% is not true. <laughs> by the, but in the press, it was 1,800. Right. When they gave the uh, complaint to the police, it was 900. I don't know what the end of it was, right. but these things also happen. But I mean, there, there, there have been reports like uh, these are like UN numbers from 2017 from your side, which is like they talk about stoning, uprooting uh, olive trees, physical assault, arson, there are shootings and property vandalism. Like, what, what, I don't think we've ever rammed people at a train station in the Palestinian Authority or shot at people on the road or through Molotov cocktails. We've had terror incidents, and I'm not going to say that this is the most peaceful uh, region in the world. Mm -hmm. It's not definitely the most violent region in the world. And again, as opposed to four years ago, the overall statistics of violence on both sides have gone down. And that also gives people the secure feeling that they can come out here and be part of our enterprise and part of our effort and continue to resettle the land of Israel. But what, what do you do with uh, people on your side that are throwing stones, that like uh, uproot olive trees? Like, do you go to them and be like, stop that? I have done that. 
I'm not going to say everybody in this community will do that. Why not? I don't know why. You don't know I why? I don't know why. I would say about 80% would do that. I know that my friend and I who lives down the road made a com police complaint against a boy who was caught breaking windows of Arab cars parked at the entrance of the community. Mm -hmm. um, look, it's very difficult to understand youth. I don't know what it was in college in Germany, but in the United States, you'd sometimes raid uh, the woman's dormitory and steal things and put it up on the flagpole or paint over things like that. And you would say to me, well, that's low level violence. That's true. But I'm, what I'm indicating is somehow youth at the age between the ages of 16 and 24 don't think things through to the end. You put us in a political situation where they see terror, they see what they think are encroachments or, or, uh, or incitement on the other side, they will react as a 16 to 24 year old. They will not react as a professor of, of 30 years old right, who's teaching university, he will say, but my young man, Mr. my Arab neighbor, please let us sit down. They're sitting down to talk pieces for Mr. Abbas and Mr. Netanyahu, and not, they're not doing very well either. It's a, it's a sorry situation. I don't like it, but uh, it's a lot better than Syria. It's a lot better than a few other places in the Middle East. Sure. But you get together like as a community and like confront those people within your society, and it's not only young people that uh, are causing no, trouble I I, on, on your side? No, I don't think it's, it's it, I don't think it's people older than the age of, I'm going to throw out 24 or 25. I don't think anybody else is involved. Uh, I'll give you an idea. In the worst case, and the trial is not over, the Duma uh, firebombing, you're talking about someone uh, who was, at the time, maybe 21, 22, and he had a friend who was maybe about 14, 15 years old, who didn't participate, but it was like in the planning according to the police. Again, the trial isn't over. Now, as we know that they were physically dealt with by the police, so I don't know exactly if 100% of what they said is true or 100% of what the police said is true. But there'll be a trial, and I'm sure that those people involved. But again, I know this is um, an excuse, maybe, we have over 450,000 people beyond the Green Line outside of Jerusalem. And you and I, have, for the past four minutes, have been talking about maybe 200 kids at the top. And they've done nothing in compared to what the Arabs have been doing to us. So is, if you could say, is there violence on both sides? Yes. Is there property damage on both sides? Yes. Stealing of land on both sides? I don't know about stealing of land. The, the, the civil administration has been very strong, even in this area. In the Shido block, a little further, what we call in the hills, they've been taking down caravans and they've been doing all sorts of things. Every, that actually sometimes causes the violence because if a shack is taken down, mm -hmm. these kids in their logic in their rational thinking, which is very irrational, <laughs> will go attack an Arab to cause the police trouble because they can't attack the police anymore. The police hit back. So they say, okay, we'll make you busy for the next day and a half. We'll take down a couple of trees. Right. So when we come to them, we tell them, you know, that's, it's like this, you know, it's, it's very unlogical. But they say, oh, we know better. So, how do you know better? Right. We've been here for 37 years. It's not better. So we go to educators. So we go to rabbis. But these people, and I'm, again, I'm talking about maybe 200 people, are in a station of life where they're rebelling. In Europe, they might wear rings on their ears or in their noses. Get a tattoo. Or tattoos all over their places like that. And you say, okay. They're harming themselves, not anybody else, or they're, they're doing something to themselves, not to anybody else. All right, but the principle still remains the same. It's an expression of revolt, of, of throwing off authority. You put someone, either in Germany or France, in that same situation, in our boiler pot, right, right in the cauldron, as we say, right. he, might, he might do something bad to someone else. You don't know.
Do they ever go to jail or get arrested? Yes. Not that many. Not enough. And I can't understand the police. I, I don't think the police are that dumb or incapable. I don't believe these stories. Well, that's me personally. Okay, I don't believe these stories. They can't get intelligence. They can't find them out. You know exactly who they are because they, they sit on the top of the hills and they, they have big head coverings, right? And they have some earlocks. You know what they look like. You know where they are. Right. They're not us. So, but I would hope it would be solved sooner than later. I've seen some videos of um, like the ultra-Orthodox, like when uh, some Palestinians wanted to um, like enter their land, be on their land and... Uh, Like with their tractors uh, to uh, to plow to, to plow the land, and then like they um, they send like women and children on the land to uh, to make sure that he, he can plow, and uh, soldiers will be that ha that happened over here yeah. at a place called Esh Kodesh uh, happened several times. Yeah, right. It happens to be that the land was thought to be state land and not Arab land, and there's still a court case going on based on aerial photographs from 15, 20 years ago, and it hasn't been decided yet. I happen to know because one day a couple of years ago, I took out the political officer from the American consulate, and it was a day after the Arabs came and burned all the plantings that had the Jews had put there. Hmm. So it's, it's a two-street Two-way street sometimes. But it's still wrong to do it two days. Still wrong for both sides. I, I haven't said it's right yet. Nope. Okay. What is your guys' visions for, uh, for this place and the settlements in the West? I didn't get a chance to listen to all I said four years ago. But I might have said maybe go through a confederation as a interim step to see if they're more capable Of, of ruling themselves. Up until now, we're 25 years since Oslo. The last elections were over 11 years ago, if not more. There's no real democracy. Human rights really doesn't exist. Last week, I read a report by Palestinian journalists saying that they have no freedom of the press. They're being uh, hounded, not by Israel, not by the occupier, but by the Mr. Abbas and his friends. Mm -hmm. So... If they haven't been able to build their own society and their own government, and don't forget, over 90% of the population, the Arab population of Judea and Samaria, is under Palestinian Authority control in either A or B. Hmm. Okay? C is a different matter, but there's a very small number of Arabs in C. Okay? And they are not... I don't want to use the word adult. <laughs> they are not at the stage of their political, social development where we could say, okay, here's your state. Go right ahead. Because the next thing, they will invite Hezbollah or Iran or something else to walk in. And then they say to Israel, you can't invade a state. That's, that's really aggression. Okay, you could walk into Nablus, Shem, overnight and pick up terrorists. That they'll forgive us, as if. So to, to say to them they can have a state tomorrow when they've had 25 years of nothing or uh, a, 20, a, a, a three-year-old Arab boy born in Ramallah 20, 30 years ago, he went through kindergarten, primary school, high school. If he was smart enough, he went to college. What type of education did he get? Is there any sort of peace education? Is there any sort of coexistence education? Mm. Do they have a peace now in the Palestinian Authority? Mm. Do they have people, you ask me, do you condemn them? Do you fight against them? Do you ask them, do they have anybody telling their people, don't kill Jews, don't throw rocks at Jews? How many in their authority are doing what you want you, not you personally, but right. your questions, representing opinion, would want us to do? Look at them. Is there a mirror image or is there not a mirror image? 
both in the good and in the bad. But I wasn't talking about the Palestinians. I was talking. I was asking you about your guys' vision. What What is the vision, of, vision. of of Jewish Jewish settlers in the West Bank? The Jewish residents of Judea and Samaria will continue to be here. That's number one. Right. Even if they get a state, because we've been told you can't have apartheid regime. And if the Palestinian Authority becomes a state and kicks me out, that's apartheid. Okay? So it works both ways. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I don't think, which was I explaining before, that they deserve a state, not in a political theory idea, but practically. But you're, you're talking about them again. Like, let's, let's... What? And so be, be because of that, number three, to answer your question, I would prefer that Israel extend sovereignty over all the area, either immediately or in stages. And exit. And exit. Hmm. Although I wouldn't use the word annex because it's my land, so I don't annex my country. That's it? That's the vision? That's my vision. I don't know. Maybe there are other people who would say, uh, let's give them uh, uh, autonomy. Right. I would agree to autonomy as a, as a step. Because I really think, I know this sounds a bit cynical, but I've been living in Israel 48 years, and I've been living in Judea and Samaria thir going on 38 years. I just finished my 37th years. Right. So I'm a little bit of a veteran, okay? I'm not, I'm not 100 years old, so I can't say what was here during the mandate. And, uh, but uh, I don't think in any sense they're capable At this point, I'm not saying that they're incapable. At this point, they're not capable mm -hmm. of running a state. And I think they really don't want the state. They, what they want is that we shouldn't have a state, not only in here, but in Israel pre-67. Right. They still have not come to the stage where they would say, and you can ask Mr. Abbas <laughs> or anybody else, do you recognize the validity of the Jewish national ethos of the Jews being a nation or an ethnic community with national rights and heritage and history in this area. Mm -hmm. Forget borders. In this general area, he will not be able, not Saib Arikat, not anybody else will be able to say that. Mm -hmm. And then we, have, we haven't even talked about the refugees, but we have President Trump taking care of UNRWA in the meantime. I'm going to talk, talk about Trump later. Uh, I mean, have you ever thought of, like, if there ever is a peace deal and or like a, a two-state solution where one, part of the deal is that you have to leave the settlements? Have you ever... That's not peace. That wouldn't be peace? That wouldn't be peace. That's not the definition of peace. But what, 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 Because if you accept that, then I would have to take all the Arabs out of Israel and put them in Palestine. They're Israelis. Like, there are 20, no, 20, no, 20 percent of... Is Israelis are... That's true. Uh, But what you're asking me, or what the question you're asking me, mm -hmm. I don't want to put you in a guilty position, is immoral. Because you're accepting that Israel must be a joint Jewish-Arab state, but Palestine should be only an Arab state. And then you're forcing me to say, wait, before even that, What about Jordan? Jordan was part of historic Palestine. That's an Arab-Palestinian state. Okay? So you, they get two states in Palestine, and I only get one. That's not fair. Forget about Israel and what you call the West Bank, what I call Judea and Samaria. So it doesn't make sense. But, but, but there, there will never be like a fair deal for everyone. I mean, you, we, we, we agree on that, right? I think no one will get a fair deal. What's happening, though, is that one side is continuously rejecting through history a fair deal and demanding to get a 100% deal and then expecting still to get a fair deal. I don't have to give you a field fair deal if you've been fighting against me for literally 100 years mm. and expect me to go all the way back to 100 years and reject the Balfour Declaration 
and the partition plan of 37 and the partition plan of 47, as if that didn't happen. And you think just because you have been strong and rejected and said it's no good, that it's all going to come your way, and maybe you'll have to give up 2%. I'm very sorry. That, in my thinking. But, I mean... We agree there's, nev there's never going to be a fair deal. But what, what if your government, the Israeli government, makes a deal and part of the deal is the settlers get out of the West Bank? That's a very unfair deal. Well, I mean, of course, of it's, course. It's I mean, the difference between... You, you, you won't like the deal, but... No, it's uh, a very, very unfair deal. Have you ever thought about what, what happens then? That uh, Are you willingly going to leave or are you going to fight your own state? Because... Well, don't, when we use the word fight, we're talking about demonstrations sure. and sit-downs. So let's, non let's make that clear for non the audience. Non-violently fight. Non-violently demonstrate, which is our legitimate right. Right. Again, I know it's, it's, it's sometimes Europeans especially say, don't talk to me about documents. Don't talk to me about history. What happens now? But what, happened, what is happening now is because people refuse to recognize what happened. This, this didn't come overnight, all right? Fifty nations said it's right to give the Jews a Jewish national home in Palestine, yeah. okay? So we belong here, all right? So you, when not you personally, in shaking a head, you are 100% what the Arabs don't want. And when you say to me, no one's going to get a fair deal, that's fine, but I shouldn't have to get an unfair deal. It has to be at least fair at the end for both sides. For it to be fair, we have to coexist. We have to have good relations. Sure. You don't have to have a state to have good relations. So why don't we build now coexistence, joint projects? Two days, three days ago, an Arab who calls himself a Palestinian had a press conference to announce that he's going to run in the J Jerusalem municipal elections. What happened to him? His Arab friends threw eggs at him hmm. because that's normalization. And the Palestinian society thinks there should be no normalization with the occupier. Hmm. I, don't, I, 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 was I don't know how you can make up these things if you were writing a novel, but that's what we have today in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. But I was just hoping like, if you, if you ever thought about leaving this place again because your Why? state because your state makes you leave because it, it's part part of the no matter how unfair it is have you ever thought the, about leaving it if the state makes me leave like they did in the gaza exactly. in 2005 yes. that's what's going to happen i don't have to like it i don't have to agree with it right. i don't have to cooperate with it in the end i might be taken out of my house by four policemen right. i have no power to overcome an army What I do have power is to say, hello, what happened after we left Gaza? Destroyed all the communities, all the greenhouses, all the agriculture. We're now living in peace with Gaza. No, we aren't. So why should I leave here? You have to make it rational. You have to make it logical. You have to have a basis of trust, of, of, of uh, security, Not only physical security, but I don't know, you want to call it psychological uh, yeah. security, that yes, I have given him something very painful, and tomorrow I will not have rockets on Jerusalem. That won't happen. I, I'm not a betting man. I don't play cards. I don't gamble. But if you ask me, like you asked me for several questions about percentages, I would say about 99% that won't happen. Mm. Well, well, Just the opposite. There'll be more violence. And they'll say, ah, oh, okay, the 1947 lines of the partition of, of 1947 in the United Nations. And after that, uh, let's go back to 1917 in the Balfour Declaration. What do you need a state for? We're very good guys. We don't believe that. When was the last time you were like in Ramallah or like in a... Uh, Palestinian dominated city here? It's been a long time. I wanted to go to Rawabi. I almost got to Rawabi. They have sometimes like journalism tours and stuff like that, but I, I, didn't, I didn't get there. Uh, 
first of all, it's against the law for me to be in Area A. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I don't... Uh, but, but there are still Israelis and uh, Jewish is Israelis there. We saw oh, yeah, sure. I mean, look, if I would say, get the settlers out of the settlements, I'd be welcome in Ramallah tomorrow. <laughs> but I don't have the proper thinking or expression to be in Ramallah. Right. You have Palestinian friends? Not anymore. What happened? Bef Oslo. The Oslo process. The Oslo process, A, separated them from us physically. Two, gave them guns. Rocks I and sticks I can deal with. When you give them guns and bullets and helicopters and armored vehicles, it's kind of difficult to be Jewish in Ramallah unless you're a left-winger with liberal, progressive, anti-occupation views. Then you have no problem whatsoever. You have pro-occupation views? No, I, I don't. <laughs> Because for you, it's not an occup occupation. For me, it's not an occupation. Right, right. It's living in my homeland. Do you ever wish you had Palestinian friends now? I mean, you, you haven't had... I have... Okay, I'm not going to say I'm representative, but I have had friends. Before, we used to go to some of the villages out here. We even went to a wedding at a place called... Uh, you can't see it from here. Zaki's house. Mm -hmm. uh, so there have been relationships. I mean, I know it sounds maybe paternalistic, but the Arab, we have maybe on the average 120 Arabs working every day in Shiloh. Four years ago it was 60, so that doubled too. Well, that's right, that's because we have a lot more work to do. But uh, <laughs> we also have an industrial area too, mm. which employs Arabs. There's an industrial plant in Barkan that has 50% Arabs, 50% Jews in principle. Uh, and... Uh, Uh, I would like, I, I know a little bit of Arabic, I would like to know more. We greet each other, I don't, I don't look away or I don't spit on the ground. I don't, they're human beings and they should be treated no less than I would like to be treated by them. I mean, you're active on Facebook, maybe like uh, reach out on Facebook and ask people like, hey, let's get together peacefully. I have tried. Yeah. One of the best ways I thought was an appeal to the American consulate that they use their um, ages, uh, their uh, sponsorship of programs of non-political, music, dancing, art, uh, literature, sports, and say, listen, let's start with, you know, 10 Jews, 10 Arabs, non-political. Let's see what we can build here. Can we build a, a format? Can we build a, 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 a framework That will help coexistence. Mm -hmm. And from there, can we say, look, we have a sewage problem mm -hmm. between you and us. Mm -hmm. We have to treat the water. Right. Okay? It's not for you and me. It's for the land. Whoever's going to be here in 10 years, the land is still going to be here. I might not be here. You might not be here. We both might be here. Mm -hmm. No, that's occupation. We don't cooperate with the occupation. If we allow you and us to hook up in the same sewage treatment plant, We're recognizing your occupation. And I, that's, you know, can't you put aside something for a moment? It just doesn't work. How many American people live here? I mean, you're American. You still have an American, American passport. American-born, I have an American passport. I would say that the Anglo, okay, Anglo. that yes, that includes England, right. Australia, right. New Zealand, South Africa. I don't think we have anybody in South Africa here anymore. It's about uh, at least 15%, maybe a little more, not 20, between 15 and 20%. Are more coming? Well, what, that usually happens. When there's a good, strong Anglo community, more Anglos come. Huh. It, look, it's difficult to learn Hebrew unless you've been studying it from the age of five or six, even in, in, abroad. Do you have to learn Hebrew? I mean, if there are so many Americans if living... If you're going to yell help in English, you better learn how to say it in Hebrew. <laughs> are, are most of your friends uh, American uh, no, Jewish no, settlers? No, no, no. I've been here 48 years, so my Hebrew is very good. And I've, did, did you still have I, like an American accent? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I still... It, it, it's, it's, I, I once appeared before a group and someone said to me, 
Mr. Medad, could you speak a little slower? You have an accent. So I said, we all have an accent. It just depends which accent. Some have a German accent. Some have a Polish accent. Some have a Russian accent. Even Golda Meir spoke with an English accent because she grew up in America. But uh, we're st look, Z uh, political Zionism is 101 years old today. Okay, We're still building the country. People, I know it's difficult for people outsiders. You know, Germans have lived in Germany for 2,000 years or more. Italians have lived in Italy. We, unfortunately, haven't lived here in the land of Israel because we were occupied, conquered, and expelled from here several times. Uh, even though we tried to come back, even though there were small communities here, but we're only 100, 130, 40 years old in terms of coming back and recreating agriculture and industry and building houses rather than living among the Arabs, like in Hebron. And the Hebron Jews have been living for five, six hundred years. But they've been living literally in and among the Arabs. They haven't done anything new. It was only 120, 140 years ago that new things began. New, what they called Moshevot, and then they came to Kibbutzim and something like that. New neighborhoods. When's the last time you've been in Hebron? We've been there uh, recently. About a half a year ago, maybe nine months ago. Do you, do you like the situation there? Because like, there, there's like segregation. There's H one and H two. Right. It's an agreement. The Palestinians signed, and we signed the agreement. What are we going to do? But there, there are roads like where uh, the settlers can take a car, and the Arabs have to walk. That's right, because of Arab terror. If they if they didn't try to kill Jews. They wouldn't be in any situation where there's security. There's no Jewish terror? I didn't say that. At the present moment, I don't think there's Jewish terror. The last time there was Jewish terror, right, was the... Um, 1994? 1994, right, the Goldstein incident. Right. There have been... Um, well, there was a massacre, not an incident. Well, okay, for, right, okay. There have been other incidents, okay? There was bombing at the, uh, in 1994 at, uh, at uh, near Netanya, all right? Where over, I think, close to 30 soldiers were killed in a suicide bombing or the buses. So we're not going to go tit for tat here, you know? Who killed more, who killed less? No. Okay, but I would say that at the present moment, Israel does not incite its citizens to terror. Israel does not pay terrorists to sit in jail, if they happen to sit in jail. Mm -hmm. And the rabbis, except for maybe one, do not encourage students to go out and throw stones against uh, Arabs, on the, unlike on the Arab side. It was, it was kind of weird to see like a, a public monument for the Goldstein It's terrorists. not a public mo monument, it's his grave site. It's not a pub. It's not a monument. It's marking his gravesite. That's all it is. In fact, more people come to visit his gravesite to take a picture and to say it's a monument than Jews who come to honor him. Well, the grave doesn't say he he committed a massacre. It says like oh, his heart is pure, his hands are clean. That's, That's his insane. grave. I I don't know. If you want to go all over the world, you will find instances where one national grouping thinks it has a hero and the other national grouping thinks yes. he's an evil person. Uh, you had a fellow in the Ukraine called Sim Simon Petliora, and he was assassinated in Paris in 1924 for pogroms against the Jews. All right? Uh, but other than that, you have people, I mean... In Jewish history, Bognan Chilmenitsky is one or two places after Hitler. But in Ukraine, he's a national hero. Uh, the Arabs here think very much of Salah Adin. So there weren't too many Jews here when he came, so I, we don't have too much against him. But I'm sure people in, in Turkey don't think much of Salah Adin. That's... That it's not odd. It's not unusual to have that situation. Let's not uh, 
make too much out of it. Does Ira Rappaport live here? He still lives here, and his grandson was bar mitzvah on Shabbat yesterday, 13 years old. Are you friends with him? Yes, I am. He's a, he, he's a convicted terrorist. And he's finished his jail term, and he hasn't done anything since. So if you're going to say, I can't be a progressive humanist liberal anymore, and treat the person on the basis of the past 20 years of his good life, then we have a different set of values. Have you ever talked to him about why he... Uh, he wrote a book. Uh, why, why he bombed the car he with wrote a book. two Arab mayors? Huh? He, right. Have you, have you talked to him? Like, did, you, yes. did you tell him? Yes. It, did I agree with him? No, and I told him so. Okay? But you're friends with him now. Look, friends don't mean that we love everything, hate everything, and go out to football parties or, 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 or whatever it is like that. He knows I think he did something wrong. He's finished his sentence, okay? And he's made positive contributions to society. That's it. You're not going to put a mark on his forehead or the letter A or the letter T on his, on his chest. He's paid his debt to society. He was judged, he was convicted, he was sentenced, and he sat in jail. And that's it. For a brief period of time. That doesn't make a difference. That's what the court, right. not you, right. or me, or anybody else decided. But does he, does he still play a prominent role in no. this community? He, he, he has a, a vineyard. That's it. Right. He's become a farmer. So you're American. Like, Are you still able to vote in the American election? Yes. Who did you vote for? Ah, uh, in America, we have a secret ballot. But you, you can still tell me. No. Did you support Clinton? Hillary? Yeah. I don't think so. That I remember. <laughs> so you voted for Trump. But I can't imagine you voting for Jill Stein. No, Jill Stein wouldn't be my cup of tea either. Uh... You're a Trump supporter? I, let's put it this way. I'm very happy that President Trump is president. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, again, if I said this four years ago, but a lot of people said, how can you be here? It's against America. Well, now it's not against America to be here or to have Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And so things change mm -hmm. for the good, at least for our good. Right. So sometimes if you sit still, hold on to things, it'll come your way. And I... And I, I, I've told many of my Arabs who I've debated either on television or in front of groups from the United States or you're like that. The borders of your future state will be where you agree to talk with us. If you don't talk with us, you will never get anything at all. So it's your choice. You think it's a zero, it's a 100% game your way. I don't think it's that way. It might be 100% my way. If you continue to refuse to negotiate, to compromise, and before that to coexist and build programs in which we're one and with each other, nothing is going to happen. What does Trump mean for the uh, Jewish settlers here? Like, uh, like uh, uh, Trump uh, being the president? Look, most of us do not get involved in internal American politics, of course, because they don't understand it. You do. I, uh, I'm different. I'm only one. That's why I'm asking you. you okay, you, you but again, you're asking me, not everybody else no. in the community. What he means is a different orientation of American policy and a different style. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the present moment, it's a lot different than Obama. You, and, you didn't like Obama, I remember that. No, I didn't at all. Uh, and uh, at the present moment, I think he's doing, at least in foreign policy, Very good. Really? Uh, yes. I, I don't know if he's going to do anything in Syria. Um, I don't know what the Europeans are going to do in Syria, or they're going to let maybe hundreds of thousands of people die. It's their choice. But again, if anything like this happens, and of course it's been going on to Syria for about six, seven years now, you'll excuse me if I tell the Europeans who are watching this, you have no moral standing here. What you've d not done in Syria, or in Turkey, on the border between Syria and Turkey. What you have not done in Yemen, what you did do in Libya, okay, or in Spanish Morocco, 
with the Polisario or, or Cyprus, which has a green line between northern and southern. Don't come to us. Don't preach to us. You have no standing. You think that because Germans, Danes, Swedens, you give money through the EU to some fictitious church organizations and the church organizations give them to NGOs here and the Arabs are able to make demonstrations and go to court and get lawyers. That doesn't give you any standing with me anyway. I think we both we support both sides in a way. But I was, I was talking about Trump. Like, Allow well, me to disagree. But like, did, did you celebrate when Trump elected? Did you? Well, I, I didn't go out and dance, okay? <laughs> I was happy. But, but is, is he someone like as a U.S. president that can bring peace to the region? That, that that's what he said. He, he wants I, to make he wants to make the greatest peace deal ever. Do you, do you uh, that's him? that's what he says. Mr. Trump is no less a politician than any other politician, mm -hmm. which means I hear him. But in Hebrew, we have a word tachlis. What's the end? What what's the conclusion? That's that's a German word too. Ah, okay, and uh, and uh, I think. He's adopted the position of placing the responsibility on the Arab side. I'm not going to get into whether he believes Israel has to give back territory or do this or do that. Mm -hmm. The main agenda item is Mr. Abbas. It's their turn. Up front. It's Let's it's see it's you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay? Because I think he's very negative. Some of the stories I've heard were yelled at him. Or now he's cutting back money from UNRWA, he's cutting back all sorts of other money like that. Awful. He's, he's treating them as a, uh, less as a politician than as a businessman. You don't want to, you know, do business with me? Fine. I'll take, why should you get money from me if you're not doing business with me? I have to make a profit on this. The profit, this could be peace. It could be an arrangement. It could be whatever. Confederation, condominium, or time, whatever. In the meantime, let's let's get somewhere. Okay, mm -hmm. you told Nikki Haley, my ambassador in the United States, that she's stupid, or something like that, uh, and you don't like Mr. Jason Greenblatt, or like that. They're my people. Who are you to tell me who who to make the? Right. All right. I mean, we, we we've been to Gaza. We talked to the head of the UNRWA there. Like, do you support that the that Americans cut the the funding for UNRWA? I mean, it it will it will make life worse for the, those people. It might uh, create more violence. Or it might force Arab states who show so much sympathy and empathy and acknowledgement and identity with the Palestinian people's problem that they'll give the money from maybe three and a half percent of their oil profits. Okay, or you could say that UNRWA is a bad organization because it's run by Hamas now on the on the administrative level. It is. All right. The schools have the Hamas curriculum. They promote the most extreme and violent educational programming possible. Their summer camps are terrorist training camps, besides the fact that there aren't five million refugees. They're the only refugee organization in the world that passes on refugee status generation to generation, right. and their death rate is very, very low. Somehow, there are a lot of people alive at the age of 110. And, um, who do you vote for here in Israel? It depends election to election. Really? I've gone, yes. You're a swing voter. I'm a swing voter. Within within the nationalist camp. There's Likud. Uh, I voted for Sharon back in 2004, I think it was. Uh, Who did you vote for the last time? I think it was the, I think it was Likud. I think before that though, it was uh, the Bennett party, the, the Jewish home party. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've gone back, back and forth several times. Depending, you, you, depending on the, on the situation. I mean, I make no, I don't hide the fact that Mr. Netanyahu could be more or better in my point of view in terms of, of his policies. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, it depends on what I'm feeling that day. Mm-hmm. Most of the time I would go Likud because I've been in the political system. You need a big party. Right. You can't com- continuously split your vote all the time for small parties. It just doesn't get anywhere. Right. Fight within the party once you've elected them. Israel, thank you so much for your time. Like the, I see a lot has changed. You're welcome to come back in another three or four years or less. We will. I mean, like, what what I kind of uh, find fascinating that unlike four years ago, more and more people, like, they support a, a one version or like a, a version of a one state solution, like with equal rights for Arab Israelis. Like, everybody would be Israeli. Right. And Jewish Israelis I and agree. Arab Israelis would have the same rights. I agree fully. I, I, in fact, if you look up a book that was printed in 1985, mm-hmm. A Stranger in My House by Walter Reich, uh, I'm in chapter four, and that's basically what I say. I, 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 one of the main differences that we didn't discuss here, I'll mm-hmm. slip it in here now for you, the demographic problem. Right. One of the pressures is that there'd be too many Arabs. And they will take over. And they will take over either uh, physically or the character of the state won't be Jewish. That hasn't happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. And check the statistics. It hasn't happened. The fertility birth rate has gone. The fertility rate and the birth rate has gone down. There's more emigration of Arabs leaving here. We have at the present moment... In the, in the Orthodox or the modern Orthodox community, we're having more babies per mother than the Arabs are. It's now we're about 3.6 or 7, and they're 3.45, right. something like that. So obviously, uh, some of the things, I don't know if I said it last time, I don't believe the demographic is a threat at all. So we'll see in another couple of years if I'm wrong or right. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.